into an ideologue of rattle on. You can hardly concentrate on what they're saying because it's dead, it's death itself speaking, and, and it, it compels zero interest. And so even discussing this sort of thing, I find difficult to even formulate the, the words because I'm so tired of that, kind of, of that, realm, of, that realm of discourse. It's like we, there's so many tremendous things that are remaining in the world for people to do if they stop being dead puppets of, of, of sick ideas. And, and, and it, it's appalling to me that, it even ha and that opposition to that even has to be justified. Our entire civilization is opposition to that. And so, I mean, we can let it go if we want, but the alternatives are far gloomier than what we have now, I can tell you that. So we can let it all go. And we're being taught to let it all go. It's corrupt, it's rotten right to the roots. It needs to be retooled right to the very concepts that we use. It's like, yeah, what's gonna replace it? What have we got that's better? You've got nothing that's better. What we have is something that could be far more than it is if people would just take it to the level that it could be taken to. And everyone wants to hear that. And then, and then well, and that's just been a very long answer. This is why 91% of the people that are watching my lectures are men, as far as I can tell. Hmm. So, Dr. Peterson, I think we have time for one or two more questions, and we might open it up to Q&A. One more question, according to Connor. Um, and I want to end with it, because you were talking about your experience as a clinical psychologist. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for students on general topics of like mental health, wellness at college, in a lot of ways, I think you have claimed that by finding more purpose, by finding more meaning, by contributing, one can develop more tolerance for oneself, one can develop more self-affirmation. I'm wondering, though, if you think there are cases where there are people with a lot of potential, especially at Harvard, who may doubt their abilities, who may get quite anxious. I'm sure you've interacted with students, with um, clients as a clinician. How do you, what advice do you give them, or what do you think college students should know about enhancing their psychological well-being at college. We've done we've done some research on that topic. I mean, one of the things that really seems to help is to write out your plans for the future. We have a program, an online program called Future Authoring that we've used with about 10,000 university students now and raised their grade point average 25% and dropped their dropout rate by about the same. Uh, it particularly works well for men who are generally underperforming women now so that I think it's raising them up. And it also works spectacularly well for non-Western ethnic minority men, which was also extraordinarily positive because you know, that's, that's, well, that, that was a great unexpected yeah. outcome. But in, some of it is to aim at something that's worth aiming at. Yeah. And, and how do you determine what's worth aiming at? You think, well, okay, here I have my miserable, wretched life. Under what conditions would it justify itself, as far as I'm concerned, personally? Like, under what conditions would my life justify itself? And so you, you think, well, what sort of future would I have to have so that I could say this is worth it? And then that's what you aim for. And, that, and technically that works in part because we know that most of the systems that mediate positive emotion in human beings, and so those would be the dopaminergic systems that have their roots in the hypothalamic exploratory centers, are activated in relationship to the pursuit of a goal, not as a consequence of attaining something. That's a consumatory reward system, but human beings mostly run on incentive reward. And so it appears that the higher the goal, the more kick you get from, from noting your progress towards that goal. Now, you have to be careful because you don't want to pick a goal that's so impossible that all you ever do is fail in relationship to it. That's an issue of self-management, right? You want, to, you want to pick a goal that moves you to the next plateau that you have a reasonable a reasonable but not certain probability of attaining. So that's that's part of it is to is to formulate a plan to decide who who it is, what it is that you want to be, who it is that you want to be from a characterological perspective. And if you're having other problems, well, you know, some of that is when you're talking more on the clinical end of things, is that again the devil's in the details, but it's useful to talk to people. It's useful to write about what it is that you're up to. It, but it's it's most worthwhile to organize your life, I would say, and to and to pick a goal and to aim at it. That's that's a very nice way of starting to straighten things out for yourself. So, I mean, I would also say, like, I've had many clients. I often advocate the use of antidepressants. I mean, people, for example, people have all sorts of physiological problems that compromise their movement forward and those have to be addressed I'm not saying that you can lift yourself up by your bootstraps in every possible situation I know that not be true 
you, you take whatever interventions you need in order to allow yourself to continue moving forward mm -hmm. in the world. But, you know, and what do you do to try to set yourself up? Well, have some friends, that's helpful. Have an intimate relationship, try to make one that's reasonably permanent, that's helpful. Aim at having a family and children, aim at being useful to the community and turning yourself into something that's noble and respectable and powerful and mm -hmm. and that'll that'll help you orient yourself when when you're young and because you'll start to see that you could have a life that was worth living that you could be not proud of that's the wrong way of thinking about it but that you could live in a, the, the right way of phrasing it is that you could live in a manner that justifies the fragility of being that's the right way to think about it that's the right way to think about it because the fragility of being is a very powerful argument against its existence and that, that's been recognized by, that was the, that, that's the fundamental ethical dilemma investigated by Goethe, for example, in his, in his play Faust. Because Mephistopheles is the mouthpiece of everyone who says, being is so fragile that it should be eradicated because it produces too much suffering. It's Ivan Karamazov's argument in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Brothers Karamazov. It's a very powerful argument. Why should any of this be? And the answer is, you justify it by how it is that by how you, ex you justify being by how you choose to exist. Mm -hmm. And you can choose to exist in a manner that produces absolutely no justification whatsoever for being, quite the contrary. But that's, that's not a pathway that I would recommend. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>
who's doing exactly that. We started doing empirical analysis of politically correct beliefs, and it's been absolutely fascinating. First of all, they do cohere. So the way we did it was we, we, we collected about 400 statements that were deemed by people in the press and so forth as indicative of politically correct belief. Mm -hmm. We did that agnostically, and this is a standard, a standard construct validation process in psychology, is that if you want to find out if something exists, you want to find out if the elements of that, that entity, say a, a, a domain of belief, co-varies, such that if you hold one belief, you're more likely to hold another belief. And so then you can pile up the beliefs